What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to Found Live. I'm Jordan Crook. I'm here with Daryl Etherington and Toy and Ajayi from City Block. What's up, guys? Hey. Hey. Good hey. Times. This is special yeah. preview. Does the audience know that only they this can is see this? Behind the scenes footage. We haven't actually started recording the podcast yet <laughs> because uh, one, we just want to hang out with you guys for a few minutes before we get started. Two, it's nice for just like rapport among the three of us. Daryl and I all barely speak, so this is good. And then also no rapport between you two at all. No, no, not. no. We, we are at each other's like throats all day long. <laughs> <laughs> never on the same page so you'll no. see Twain. yeah yeah um but what i did want to say to our live audience is that obviously we're coming to you live so you're getting the episode early yay good for you and two if you want to ask questions yourself or you know have thoughts that you want to share with us questions you want to ask directly to Toyan, the best way to do that is to actually hop over into hopin so that link can be found in the caption of wherever you're watching. We're on YouTube right now, Facebook, et cetera. Um, if you're not on Hopin, you can click that link, register real quick. It's free still, but it'll allow you to chat. Um, and we actually see those questions come in live and we can include you in the podcast itself. So that's a pretty cool opportunity. If you're interested, do that. If not, chill on YouTube, whatever. It's all cool. But just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. What if there's nobody there? What if they're not listening at all? Well, that's better for... All of us, I think, right? I mean, that's the same as a regular podcast. That <laughs> that's true. That is true. So okay, no change Fair for is. me. But they're <laughs> no there. Harm. I believe they're there. I mean, you're a big deal, Toyin. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Fair, fair, fair. No, I mean it. I mean it. I yes. remember. I, you're a draw. I, I connected my partner to you for that for that speaking thing. And yes. I mean, you're all over the place now. You're like. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I'm sure just like, in have me come in feeling chill. Yeah, right? Like, no, like, we're gassing oh. you up. We're getting hype. It's time to go. <laughs> well, um, do we have any other thoughts before we hop into the... I'm going to keep saying hop in, I think. That's going to be my code word for this yeah. episode. Well, um, I, people should really get in there. Because, I mean, we already have... We got a question teed up. So, it's accurate. Do we? Yeah. I oh, there's hop You it's know what? Hop in is hop in. Oh, yeah. dear. Oh, oh dear. Um, yeah, it's, oh, it's too late, it's, This is where we're at. You already agreed to this, and you're here. <laughs> Did not know I was signing up for the ridiculous puns. Okay. Yeah, no, I default to punny when I've got a little adrenaline going, so I'll, I'll see what I can do. And uh, with that, are you yeah. guys ready to go live? Yeah, Definitely. let's do it. Do it. All right, found live in three, two, one. Hey, I'm Daryl Etherington, and I'm joined by the uh, medical practitioner to my uh, amateur, <laughs> amateur <laughs> healthcare provider. I yeah, don't know maybe this I... one. I didn't think about this one in advance. Yeah, but... clearly you didn't, and I have no medical degree or student debt to speak of. <laughs> Neither so... of us do, to be clear, for legal purposes. <laughs> yeah, not doctor. <laughs> but my co-host, you Jordan all know Crook. her. That's right, yeah. Jordan Crook. Uh, and you know me, Daryl Etherington. I'm TechCrunch's managing editor, um, and we are here to do Found. So Found is TechCrunch's podcast where we talk to the founders behind the startups and we hear about their stories. We do this uh, typically offline, so you don't get to see all this wonderful stuff that you get to see today. Um, you just get to hear the audio after the fact. So it's very exciting that we're here live with you uh and we're doing also our other podcast equity fantastic podcast uh in case you don't already listen and that's happening next thursday live so we alternate live on thursdays so please join us uh whenever you can um yeah in a regular episode of found jordan and i talked to an early stage founder like i said about what they do to build their company but because it is live you can actually participate so you can join the chat and hop in you can ask questions you can decide daryl and jordan are bad at asking questions my questions are better yep. and then you can put those in there and we can uh we'll, we'll pick them up we'll see them we'll, we'll open admit. to feedback yes we're very open to feedback basically <laughs> normally we get none but we just think it's amazing and then we yeah we're great our lives <laughs> prove us uh, wrong 
so if you want to do that and you're listening on another platform, maybe you're on Twitter Spaces or YouTube, the link is pinned to our profile so you can join through there and then just get registered real quick. Uh, uh, it's free and then you can come in and participate with questions. So also wanted to remind folks that TechCrunch early stage is coming up. That's on April 14th. So it's the ultimate educational resource for startups. We have experts in fundraising, marketing, and operations talking about uh, their advice and their insights and their experience. Uh, there's lots of time for Q&A in each of those sessions. And it's also our first fully in-person event since the start of the pandemic. So we're super excited to be back in person. Um, we also have a special deal for people tuning in today. So this is for TechCrunch Plus. And we're going to offer you 25% off uh, the regular price subscription to TechCrunch Plus. So if you're not familiar with that already, that's our premium product. And what you get there is deep dive interviews with some of the best startup founders and investors in the industry. Uh, you get market maps. You get all kinds of cool stuff. You can subscribe at techcrunchplus.com. That's the easiest way to get there. Or if you're already on TechCrunch and you're just like dual windowing with TechCrunch and with this event, you can just click <laughs> on, on any TC Plus. As everyone link. should be. Yes, always, please. And and you'll get a prompt to subscribe. And then you just put found in as the, the uh, discount Promo code and you get 25% off. Yeah. Dual you nailed windowing. It. Nailed it. That's a whole new term. I'm, I'm taking notes. <laughs> it's a verb. <laughs> it's a verb. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. We verbed it. <laughs> like it, like it. Well, that's the voice of our guest. Yes. I'm very, very excited for you guys to be with us today. We have City Blocks co-founder and president Toyan Ajayi with us. Thanks for coming. Hey, yeah. thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Uh, and we typically what we do here, Toyan, is we start with you kind of giving the high level overview of, of what the company is. So why don't you go and do that? I mean, me, we are actually, pretty well versed now because we've had you on previous we had you at disrupt and mm -hmm. we had your co-founder on a previous episode of tech crunch live i think it was extra crunch live but a lot of people your city block knew. like your you're city the block. unicorn city block, city block yeah like momentous but in case but, people don't know yeah not to make those people who don't know feel bad maybe you should just fill them in. start with the remedial part of the conversation yeah. for those people yeah, who yeah. don't know yeah. <laughs> um, losers yes <laughs> um <laughs> It's, it's, it's all, it's all a little bonkers. Um, uh, but, um, so, so city block for a healthcare provider, um, we provide primary care and behavioral health and social care, um, to folks who have been historically marginalized in the healthcare system, primarily people, um, who are receiving their health insurance through Medicaid. So who are lower income, um, and people who receive their, their insurance through Medicare and Medicaid by virtue of having a disability and also being lower income. Um, and, um, and typically folks who live in, in, in urban centers and cities, which is where a lot of, um, a lot of these populations and challenges are sort of concentrated. Um, the way that we work is we partner with health insurers that have um, uh, health insurance um, coverage for these individuals with complex needs. Um, and we help them identify who amongst their population has the most significant physical health, mental health, and social health challenges. Um, who's most likely to fall through the cracks from the tr traditional healthcare system? Who's most likely to need like extra support in achieving their health and well being goals? Um, and then we provide an integrated clinical model to them um, that's tech enabled, that's focused on. First of all, meeting people where they are, like just finding people and building a relationship of trust um, mm -hmm. so that we have the ability to actually learn and understand what matters to those individuals. Um, and then delivering healthcare um, and clinical clinical care and social care um, through our, our multidisciplinary teams. Um, and that's in the home, in our clinics, virtually 24 seven, really just trying to make sure that they have everything they need. And that, that as a result, they can avoid having to go to the hospital with worsening complications of their illnesses, um, can spend more time in the home, in the community, with their families, going to their job. Um, and, and overall, in so doing, we're able to actually save dollars in the healthcare system because the typical um, care delivery environment really focuses on spending a lot more money on hospitals mm -hmm. than you would spend on primary care and mental health in the community. And if we can shift that balance, we achieve the sort of nirvana in terms of a, you know, a socially oriented business where we can provide really excellent service to our, to our members. That's what we call the patients whom we serve. We can meet their needs, deliver our experience of care that's respectful and dignifying and also save money in the healthcare system that allows us to reinvest in our model and reinvest in and growing our business. So that is what we do. So yeah. it's like those savings come from like the proactive, proactive preventative 
look at some of the folks who likely will end up in the hospital with a high cost issue, right? Like, is that yeah. what we're talking about? That's right. And if you look at the map, I mean, it's kind of astronomical, right? Like you think about, so take, take somebody who say has five diabetes, um, they've been struggling to keep their blood sugars under control. And that's partly because they don't have enough food to eat. And so they don't, they can't buy leafy, healthy meals. Um, uh, they're often eating uh, fast food because that's cheaper. And they don't have mm -hmm. access to all of the supports that other people may benefit from. Maybe they have trouble understanding all their meds. Uh, maybe they have trouble filling their prescriptions. Maybe they have trouble getting transportation to go see all the specialists they're supposed to see and they're falling through the cracks. And what would typically happen without city block is that that person would get sicker and sicker. Their blood sugars would get worse and out of, and more and more control, out of control. And something would happen that would send them to the hospital, mm. either a really bad infection in one of their limbs or a really high blood sugar that infects their kidneys. Um, something will happen. And if they get into the hospital, typically that's a $10,000 admission. Right, They'll spend yeah. four or five days away from their family in the hospital setting, getting intensive medical treatment at really high cost, and they'll get discharged back home. But none of those structural problems I described, the transportation, the food, none of that gets solved in a hospital visit, right? Yeah, so right. if you can take all of those spe that spend and anticipate that something's going to happen and invest instead in primary care and mental health and social care, and it's so much cheaper to do, right? Like mm -hmm. you can provide you know, 500 hours of time with a community health worker, getting them food stamps, helping them um, understand how to cook healthy meals, um, working with their family members and providing them supports if they're fatigued, making sure that they have support to get to the pharmacy and get their meds, uh, providing mental health su supports because so many people with chronic conditions have totally unrecognized and unmanaged behavioral health needs. Yeah. You can do all of that at a fraction of the cost and avoid the hospitalization from ever happening. And your patient is healthier and happier their family members are healthier and happier. Our communities are healthier and happier. And we've invested resources in places that actually deliver long-term value to the healthcare system that we can then reinvest the sort of the, the surplus in growing our business and um, improving services to the patients who we serve. Yeah. So I mean, I'm so, oh, go ahead, Jern. Well, I'm just, I'm the representative for the like early, the people who don't know as much. So I'm speaking on their behalf. I know everything, but like, obviously, just obviously you got yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. So like the, my, this is not two, at all complicated. just my <laughs> clarifying follow-up questions, right. Is like, how do these people hear about you? Cause the person that you're describing to me sounds like someone who isn't like, uh, f based on circumstance, like proactively seeking that primary care, right? right? So like, how do you actually get them on board in yeah. the first place? And then two, like, who's actually paying you? Like where yeah. does like city blocks revenue come from? Yeah, so so I'll actually start with the first, the, the second question. Um, and so what happens when when folks like this patient I just described, who they get their health care through Medicaid, so they sign up for Medicaid. And what typically happens in most states in the country is that the Medicaid, the state program, um, delegates the care to a, a private insurer. So it's either United Healthcare or Cigna or someone you've heard of, one of these names, or a community-based health insurer, they actually are administering the health insurance for that patient, right? Even though it's funded through tax mm -hmm. revenue through the Medicaid program. Right. These insurers um, really struggle, like for all the reasons you described, to find people like this patient because they're not often seeing their primary care doctor. Maybe they don't have a steady address. And so when you send them something in the mail, they're couch surfing or they're living um, in shelters or they honestly, like they're just too busy making ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis right. to get all you know, to follow up with all of the things that are so complex to navigate in the healthcare system. So that's why part of what we do that is so important is around engagement. So we'll, we work with the health insurer, we identify these people, we show, we see them in the data. You can see their data, that they're high risk and rising risk people, that they have needs that are being unmet. You can even look at people who, you know, have medical conditions that don't appear to have been treated because we can see all of the health insurance bills that were paid. They didn't see a primary care doctor last year. Something's going wrong, right? They haven't seen a, we know they have a mental health diagnosis, but they haven't seen a psychiatrist or a therapist. We should really try to find this person. And we take a really proactive approach based on the data to identify these people. And then we go find them. And we don't wait for people to come to us. Um, we're really intensive and really, really structured about going to find people. And it's not just physically finding them, you know, did I get the right address and knock on the door? Most of these folks have had so many like terrible experiences, honestly, with the healthcare system. Yeah. Imagine being somebody who 
um, struggles with a mental health diagnosis, has bipolar disorder on their, on their medical list. And every time they go to the hospital, no matter what it's for, they get treated really badly because that's what we do for people who struggle with mental health. Um, they're not gonna be like delighted to have a doctor at their front door. They don't wanna see me knocking on their door at five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, they've had terrible experiences with people who are very similar to me. And so it's really important that we engage people in a, in a, with a way that's respectful and dignifying, but that is deserving of gaining their trust. And that for us has been through a team of folks on our team called community health partners and outreach specialists. These are people who don't have clinical training, um, but they do have deep, deep expertise in understanding the lived experiences of the people whom we serve. Often they have very similar personal life stories and backgrounds. They have um, real expertise in understanding social services and the importance of social connectivity and social delivery to healthcare. And they're incredibly tenacious. They're compassionate, they're persistent, but they're really committed to accompanying and finding and building relationships with our members. They're really highly skilled professionals who we provide a lot of support and training to. And so when they knock on the door, when they make a phone call to one of our members, they're able to really draw them in and help convince them that, that they may wanna have another conversation with us. And sometimes that maybe that's just it. That's all you get from the first conversation is, can we talk to you again? But oftentimes you're asking people to share the most intimate stories about their lives. Are you hungry? Are you lonely? Um, how do you feel about your medical issues? What are you most afraid of? What do you wanna have happen to you when you start to approach end of life? These are, these are really deeply important variables for healthcare, but they're very hard to get come by in a 10 minute doctor's office visit where the person doesn't even feel like th that you care about them, right? And so really using our community health partners and our community-based model of care to build that engagement and build awareness <laughs> is a key part that then allows us to earn the right to take care of folks and to deliver all the rest of our services, our primary care and mental health and pharmacy and all the other things that we deliver in our model. Hmm. So yeah, like what wow. to, to me, it's like, if I'm thinking about from an insurer perspective, I guess I, cause it sounds like a, everything you're talking about from that side is very effort intensive, but to your other point, it's like not actually that cost intensive, especially when you're comparing it to the resulting costs that come out on the other end. Right. But it, was it just a case of like, it was invisible to insurers because they didn't go to the, to the effort of figuring out what that looked like from a dollars and cents on a balance sheet like how did how did you identify this need i guess and the fact that there was an opportunity to do this and also do it within the structures that exist uh in the modern like u.s healthcare system right yeah i mean i think a couple of things i think so insurers know this they know this they know this to be true right like they see it in, if they could wave a magic wand, all of their patients who had high needs, complex needs would be getting what we deliver. Mm. So they know it's a need. Um, it's not that they're blind to it. They know that there's an opportunity to provide a much better experience of care and much more engagement and much more proactive care to their, to their most, um, their, 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 the patients who are most in need. But remember, you know, they're an insurance company. They're not, they're not a healthcare delivery organization. Um, they're, they're, they don't typically employ you know, the number of people, boots on the ground in a community to provide that care. There's also a really interesting question about um, whether people want to receive that type of care from their insurer or whether actually there's something about the identity of being a healthcare provider that CityBlock has. It's a little bit separate. That's important in building those relationships and earning that trust. Um, and so it's not, it's certainly not at all that they didn't see the gap. It's that they, they needed a solution. And the reason why there haven't been as many other solutions in the space historically is that it requires us to totally rethink how we deliver healthcare, right? So most, most primary care doctor's office are not equipped to do what we do. Mm -hmm. to, if, if somebody calls at 10 o'clock at night and says, I, you know, I'm having uh, palpitations and I'm not sure if I'm anxious or if I'm having something terrible happen to me, what should I do? Most doctor's offices will send you to the emergency room because they right. can't lay hands on you at 10 o'clock at night. They're not open. Um, we, we actually send people to their homes. We send paramedics and EMTs to, to our members' homes um, in the evenings, on the weekends, to lay hands on them, check out what's going on, check their vital signs, get labs, do EKGs, provide treatment in their home. So that's a whole other way of delivering care that most providers can't do. Um, we talk about behavioral health as being a massive problem. In the fee-for-service environment, which, which is you know, sort of the typical healthcare system where you get paid per visit, a doctor, mm -hmm or a therapist will get paid per visit. The way that, and this is historical due to bias in the way that, that um, and, and, and policy in the way that healthcare is reimbursed, 
therapists and psychiatrists don't get paid a whole lot of money by Medicaid to provide a, an hour long visit, even though that's such a critical intervention. And what that, that's done is historically it's constrained supply. So a lot of these um, incredibly important trained professionals in the community are not providing access to care for people on Medicaid, for low income patients. They'll get way more money seeing you know, a commercially insured person who gets a really nice, um, much more rich benefit through their um, through their health insurance that they get through work um, or the, or getting pa cash pay. And so we actually have to bring in a whole bunch of clinical care that doesn't exist in a lot of the communities we provide with our therapists and our psychiatrists, our palliative care clinicians, all of these providers. Um, and then finally, we have to rethink, honestly, the role of power in, in the relationship between patients and doctors. And that requires an entire mindset shift from the idea that that for patients to access my wisdom and my grand wisdom as a physician, right. they have to like, you know, when you talk about, you know, the, the cost and the high intensity of labor, think about the intensity of effort for patients. Historically, what we're saying is, hey, look, I know you've got a million things going on. Maybe you're, you know, struggling with your housing. Maybe you're trying to find a new job. Maybe you've got a couple kids you're taking care of. But you know what? When you are in need for medical care, I'm going to make you like, Make a phone call between the hours of eight to five. Wait on hold for however long. Trudge make down here. In a wait for two down hours. Here. Yeah. Fill out the same application over and over, over and over again, over right? right? Like the same. Like that's what we're asking people boxes. to do, and we're asking them to use their time. That is, in many ways, their only asset for many people. Certainly, their most precious asset, um, and they're not getting a lot of value out of it. And so, and, but but it makes us feel good. Us as doctors in the healthcare system, we built these institutions. I'm most powerful when I'm in my doctor's office with my white coat on. I have right. all the knowledge and the information. People come to me. I'm fully clothed. They're in that horrible thin paper towel sheet thing. You know, it's just the, the, the power structures are so skewed in favor of the clinicians and the physicians in particular and away from the patient. And so we actually have to rethink all of that. We have to go to people's homes and see them on their own turf. We have to give them the opportunity to tell us what works for them. We have to earn their trust. Mm -hmm. We have to um, shed our white coats and talk to people like they're real people. Um, we have to delegate authority to other members of our team, people who didn't go to medical school right. because they're experts in social needs and they're experts in the relationship. We got to work with different types of teams. It's a whole redesign of the way that the healthcare system operates. And that's daunting for many and it's complex mm -hmm. for others. And it requires a different economic structure to fund all of this because we're talking about taking financial risk for the long-term outcomes, um, which if it goes well is great. And if it doesn't, is a real exposure that traditional fee-for-service providers don't have. You get paid for what you do, easy yeah. peasy. Um, and so, so some of the, those are some of the reasons why this hasn't existed before, but why when we built our company and started to talk to insurers and talk to members, the patients and the community members we serve, there was an obvious resonance. There's a real need um, for this in the market, right? It's very clear. And so um, that's really enabled us to gain traction and to grow. But so how did you then change the, like you just gave us like a ton of reasons why, especially medical professionals would not want to do this, right? But what, what are the reasons you gave them to do it? What, like, how did you change the incentive structure so that people would be like, yes, I would rather do this, right? It's because you're not rather just take like, off my white coat. Like yeah. I, I think yeah. about the doctors that I've met and I've been friends with and know, and I think of like, I mean, rightfully so incredibly proud to be doctors, right? Yeah. Like, and maybe well, not like yes. loving the power structure as described by you, right? Like, oh, but maybe I'm secretly wielding. loving it. But like, there's probably part of them unconsciously that's like, <laughs> yes, I go into this office and you sit on the bed and like, I am the doctor who like worked hard for that degree. And like, I know best, right? And there's a vibe to that. And how do you get them to come and be city block healthcare providers who are saying like, no, no, like, all of the, like the same amount of respect and kind of like a claim that I feel in that environment, I'm just going to take off and actually like help people. Yeah. I mean, I think it comes back to my own personal journey, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm that doctor, right? Like I trained in this system and I wore my white coat as, and the power that came with it as a, as a defense mechanism against the deep insecurity and the experience of, of recognizing that I actually didn't have all the tools to help my patients. And if I looked at that fact for a little too long, it started to feel really uncomfortable and really disheartening because we're taught to have all the answers and we're taught our job is to cure people, like actually to cure people. Right. And I don't have the power to do that. I don't have the power to do that most of the time, especially for the things that my patients are struggling with. I need them to do stuff too. And I need other people to help me 
solve all the other barriers that I'm not an expert in solving. And so when you, when you really talk to physicians and clinicians, you realize that we're here because we want people to live their best lives. We want to help to heal. And we actually know we don't have all the answers. And if we can acknowledge that and recognize that the only way that we get better outcomes for our patients is by working in partnership with them and in partnership with other people in our healthcare ecosystem, including people who didn't go to medical school, including people who didn't go to nursing school, you realize that you can actually see the results you wanted to see, the thing you've been wanting this whole time, right? The, the prevention of that person having that amputation, um, the person who has been struggling for years and years and years with their substance use challenges, who finally is able to connect and, and get into treatment and also has the social supports to, to retain their, um, their recovery. Like, that is, that is the most incredibly motivating feeling out there. And unfortunately for many of our physicians, particularly in primary care, you don't get that feeling that often. Right. Because when your job tells you that to be successful, you need to spend your entire day seeing as many people as quickly as possible, and you have basically one tool, which is a prescription, and maybe a waggy finger to tell you to do something differently. Right, right. Um, and you know it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Um, you can't actually do what you need to do for these folks in that model. Um, this becomes an incredibly attractive alternative to people where you really can do the work that you wanted to do by sharing power, both with the patients who you're serving and with other members of the team, and by recognizing that it really takes a village in many instances, and you're one part of it. I have expertise, I never, no one can take that away from me, but if my patient doesn't believe me or have the tools and resources to act on my advice, my expertise is useless. And I've got to figure out how to get other people to support me to get that patient to the place where they wanna take their medicines that I prescribed for them, where they yeah. want to engage in more healthy behaviors, um, where they wanna to come to therapy, because that's actually what's gonna change the needle for them, change the outcome for them. Yeah. yeah, I kind of like glossed over the fact that most people become doctors because they want to help people. So it's probably right. fair to yeah, not uh, address is monstrous, that piece. Yeah, I guess. Like, <laughs> oh, I want to be in power. Yeah, but um, I did so, I, like I felt fair. relief when you were describing that. So I was kind of like, because like, like as you're talking true. about like what it does to to people who are in those positions, like you can feel how that would be a great relief to be like I've. Like I've got this thing ahead of all else. Like I want to do this thing and it's an immense stress to me. And I don't even have, I have no possibility of doing that. So just the yeah. admission of like, we know you don't, and we know that. It and it's okay. Help, you don't have right? to have all the answers. That's right. Yeah. And we can, we can do this together. So Toyin, yeah. like, what does that mean for you? Like on, on your end, right? Cause you came from being a doctor. I mean, you're still a doctor. You'd forever be a doctor, Never but like, <laughs> yeah, no matter what, with or without the white coat. Um, I mean, but I like, can take it, but I don't know. Okay. Okay. Well, all right, fine. <laughs> hey, hey. Errol, don't go so negative. I'm, yeah. We'll go. Seriously. Anyway. What a downer. But like, you know, going from practicing constantly, right. To then running a company, right? And being like the leader of, of this organization. I want, I'm curious like about kind of that transition for you and like how it felt for you as a person, right? Like less about like city block and more just like toy and the human being who essentially like changed jobs mm -hmm. and is figuring and, and not only changed jobs once, but like as city block grows, your job changes. I imagine like pretty yeah, rapidly every few months, right? Yeah. And like, what is that like for you? And what's been the most, the biggest challenges and what kind of has surprised you the most in that? Yeah, I think um, I really like learning and I like learning stuff by doing stuff. Um, and so I find it really, honestly, it's a privilege. Like it's so motivating and so exciting for me to get to learn new things and to get to learn how to have impact in different ways. So. I think I didn't have as abrupt a reaction to the transition. It also happened incrementally, right? Like for yeah, the last decade, I've been sort of shifting my focus in trying to think about how I scale impact away from just the one-on-one -on -one patient encounters. I still see patients. I still get such value from it. I love, love, maybe more than any other hat I wear, honestly, I love being with patients hmm. and I love um, the privilege of getting to understand their lives and just be with them. And I also, I wouldn't be satisfied if I didn't have an opportunity also to take what I learned from my patients and use it to make the system better for more people. So being able to do both to me is, I just, I, I don't know how I got so lucky, honestly, it, hmm. it really, it feels 
just incredibly like such a privilege to get to 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 go from the individual one on one where this person and only this person is my focus to thinking about the tens of thousands of people who we're accountable for and the millions of people who we would hope to serve in the future is such an incredible vantage point to have and um and really it, it it's a gift i think and, and just a gift of, a, of an opportunity for me to to really have impact at that scale so yeah. when did you actually have that realization though that like you should you should try to scale your impact like did you because i know you were at sidewalk like was that was it before that was it that what caused you to go seek out that kind of opportunity or when when were you like okay like i, I love this part i love the patient part but how do i really scale that impact well, it started actually before that, and it started almost, it, there was a negative lens to it first, which was I was seeing a lot of patients. I'd finished residency. I was uh, primarily a physician taking care of people in the hospital with very, very complex needs in a safety net hospital. So these were entirely the types of folks that I serve now um, have always been my focus. And so I was taking care of people with disabilities, people who struggled with mental health and addiction almost entirely the population I served were, were folks struggling with low income, uh, disproportionately people of color. And I was seeing these terrible outcomes that were happening to them. And I was realizing that I wasn't happy. Um, and even though I loved being a doctor in those moments, I was feeling all the things I described, that mm -hmm. sense of powerlessness to actually impact the trajectory because I didn't have the tools. Uh, and I started experimenting a little bit with myself as the, as the subject to say, what if I give when I discharge a patient from the hospital, I know they can't get to see their primary care doctor for seven to 10 days. But what are they gonna do when they get home? They've had you know three weeks of being in the hospital with someone feeding them meals three times a day, checking their blood sugars, giving them insulin, making sure all their meds are, are teed out on the tray. And then we just send people home. We just like mm -hmm. toss them out, right? And, um, and most folks who are high risk don't, I know they don't have enough food to eat. I know they're not gonna be able to eat the same meal that we're feeding them in the hospital. I know that they they won't have, you know, clean um, uh, environment in their home to take their medicines. I don't even know if they can pick up their prescription when I discharge them. And that knowledge and that, that visibility of the evidence because people kept coming back to the hospital right. um, was so disheartening. And so I started experimenting. I said, well, what if I give people my cell phone number and I have them text me when they get home and call me or take a picture of, of their meds, or um, I will follow up and do a home visit. What if we actually just wrap around people better? What if I call their primary care doctor and instead of sending them a fax, who knows how many days after they get discharged with the information of what happened, what if I actually call them and say, hey, I'm sending Ms. Smith home and this is what happened. This is what I'm worried about. These are the things I'm gonna do. Can I help you? And here's my number, call me if you need it. Like mm -hmm. truly just, the basics in many ways and it started yeah. to have an impact you know things like what if i said to my my patient who has you know 30 medicines and lives on a park bench um on a street somewhere and um and has been in and out of the hospital six times in the last month what if i asked him for real like real talk how many medicines can you take a day because it's not 30. Mm -hmm. and let's pick the top five and let's listen to what he says about his life and what he's able to do. And let's meet him there. And let's accept that we're not going to be providing the most evidence-based treatment for every single one of his medical issues. But maybe we actually, right. by listening to him, we increase the chances that he does the thing that he can do. And then we make progress in that way. And by starting to sort of just try this out and see that there was value here, I started to get really convinced that it was possible to um scale these models and then i got really lucky and i was hired to join an organization called commonwealth care alliance in massachusetts that had been founded by um a, a really radical group of, of clinicians um who had exactly the same ideas way before i did and i realized i wasn't alone that was mm -hmm. really important i'm not alone yeah. other people see this um and they'd already built stuff and i could start to be part of a group of other clinicians and innovators who were trying to do things differently for these people. And so finding a community of folks, starting to realize that it was possible to do things differently and to get better outcomes as a result, and then having an infrastructure to plug into was so important to me really early in my career. And then from there, the idea of, well, how do we scale this right. just became sort of an obvious extension. Yeah, no, I think that a lot of what you said there reminds me of um, when I went to school, I wanted to go into pedagogy for a long time and like we read a lot uh, thanks to one of my instructors like the paulo Freire has the pedagogy of the oppressed which is yeah. like very much about 
dismantling power structures that exist between educators and students and kind of meeting people where they are and embracing the concept of love in like the way that you're just like respect the other person as a full human being and respect okay. their full experience right and i think it's it sounds exactly like like what you're talking about in a healthcare context and you know that was very powerful for me for education uh, then i went and did this stupid thing instead and I have no impact. Anymore, but... Stop it. <laughs> Not true. Not true. But like it, it does, um, you know, it, it, it sounds so obvious when you like think about it, but, but like so many people in your, in your profession didn't, right? Or like didn't find that thing. Like you're, you're lucky you found people who did, but a lot of people don't. But I guess now you're in a position where you can go say like, hey, there is a way out. And you know, you've seen all the problems and maybe you didn't come to the solution part, but we have the, the solution part. And now we can present you with that, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a really powerful shift. And I think in, you know, on that sort of, uh, what do you need to be an entrepreneur, right? Like you need this sort of unassailable hope and optimism and a belief in a better or different future. And especially in something that is as entrenched as healthcare um, and an institution that is entrenched as healthcare where there are so much complexity having proof points that it is possible to do things differently is incredibly inspiring and motivating and important along the way. Now, I seek those out everywhere, even today, you know, just those signs that, oh, we can, you know, systems are a result of human beings' decisions and actions. We can, we built them, we can unbuild them, we can change them. Um, it's possible to do that. And so that reminder that it is possible to do things differently and the evidence of such has been always just incredibly inspiring to me. And it, and it gives me in many ways the the strength to keep going sometimes when when you hit up against those entrenched ways of being and realize that how deeply deeply structurally embedded they are mm -hmm. yeah so while we're kind of on that like transition time for you plan i i thought we could get some of these audience questions in if that's cool with you oh yeah totally. um Rhonda sanders adam Asked, oh, I was what gonna was ask your this too. It's like perfect for this, I feel like. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Just no, go, Jordan. Go, go, go. She asked, what was your MVP? Like what was the first product? What was the beginning? Oh goodness. Um, so the beginning was uh the model of care that I started honestly delivering as a little bit as a solo person, the solo clinician, uh, then evolved when I was at Commonwealth Care Alliance, um, uh, which is a nonprofit health plan in Massachusetts that provides um, uh, care and insurance to folks who are um, dually eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, and then evolved into our time at Sidewalk Labs. And so I moved I moved to New York in the spring of 2017, um, along with my co-founder, um, Aya Ram, who also moved to Massachusetts. And, uh, and we met our other co-founders there, Baygross, Matt Belez, and started to really prototype what what tech enablement of a clinical model focused on a different population than, than I had been before, um, more focused on Medicaid and duly eligible folks with complexity. And the, the first iteration of that is, is the partnership we launched in, in New York in the summer of 2018 uh, with a health plan in, in New York, focusing on their highest risk and most rising risk individuals in, in central Brooklyn, uh, where we provided primary care and continue to provide primary care, behavioral health and social care navigation supports um, to this population of folks um, in, a, in, a, in a structure in which we take risk on outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so we're really focused on reducing that total cost of care. And yeah, so like that like provided you with what you needed to then go and say, it, this is work, like how did you provide, what did you collect initially as like the evidence that this is working? And if you provide us with more funding and if the, the insurers, like if you provide us with more sort of like uh, access to clients or whatever, like this is gonna work better, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think you start with the, the leading indicators of a model like ours, which goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is about engagement. Mm. So many, most of these members are people who Again, the plans know that they're high risk. They know that because they see the they help they see the claims. They see what what's going on in their healthcare by virtue of what gets paid for. So they see there's a real opportunity there. They see there's a real gap in the care that people are receiving, but they have trouble reaching them. And so we are able to show that we can engage folks. We can find them first of all, and we can engage them, and we can build an understanding of what's going on for people. That is the, the necessary precondition for doing anything else, right? Mm -hmm. You have to actually be proximate to the people you're serving in order to then deliver care to them. And so to be able to show that we could um, build a workforce, build models, 
outreach and engage folks and deliver care to them was a really important first step in demonstrating that there was real opportunity to grow this. And then how did you think about like next steps, right? Because like the, the, the end result, which we don't even know what exactly it is. I'm sure you have a vision in your mind, but like the, the promised land of city block being exactly what it's supposed to be. Right. is like an incredibly ambitious thing. It, it, and pr particularly on the surface, like, I think when you break it down and I'm sure this is how you got those insurance companies on board is like, yeah, it sounds cost intensive to like go meet people where they are and like hire a bunch of doctors and all of these things. But Actually, it saves money. Like, just look at the math real quick. Like, that part is one thing, mm -hmm. but it just sounds so ambitious, and you do have to go one step at a time, right? So, like, first is like we can find people, and we can we can get them engaged, right? And then, like, mm -hmm. how do you think about next? Like, how did you build it out? Because there's so many suites of products now. There's pregnancy care, and there's you know um, mental health care, and all of these things. Like, how did you step it out? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that you, we don't actually think about them as suites of products as much mm. as we think about um, uh, holistic care capabilities, right. right? So a person may need mental health services this month or next month. They need a primary care visit the month after. Uh, they need supports for food and housing and transportation all the time. Recognizing that this is a heterogeneous population. People have a lot of different needs and actually being able to address the most impactable needs up front and well is the most important thing. Over time, you build on additional capabilities, but you gotta start with the basics, right? Yeah. And so it was really very much about starting with the foundations. Primary care, can, can we get people to see physicians or advanced practice clinicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, uh, regularly to address their chronic conditions? Can we make sure that the most pressing social needs are met? Housing, food, transportation, um, connectivity and relationships. Can we make sure that every single person who needs treatment for anxiety, for depression, or for schizophrenia, or for their bipolar disorder gets it? Can we make sure that if, if someone is struggling with substance use, um, with addiction, that, uh, that A, they're not stigmatized, and B, that we're able to either provide or connect them to the services they need? You start there, and then you start to layer on the next and additional capabilities that you need in order to deliver outcomes. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. I think this is a related question um, that you may have already answered in part, but like uh, another audience question. So uh, Mariam Sane, I don't, apologies if I mispronounced that, but uh, asks, how did you overcome the challenges of taking on insurance companies? And then how did you convince them to work with you, especially, I guess, early on as you, when you were a brand new startup? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's similar to the it is similar to the other, other question. I mean, it, we're taking them on is we're we're partnering with them. We're helping them yeah. do their job better, which is providing care and enabling care to people who need it um, in a way that avoids waste and worsening um, inequities and poor health outcomes. Right, like that we're actually an enabler of the thing that they're intended to do, um, and so that that synergy is very obvious and was very straightforward in many ways. To, uh, to, to implement because people see it, it's, it's an obvious synergy. How do we convince them to partner? I think similarly, we're obviously we're asking them to do things differently. We're asking them to pay us differently than they mm -hmm. usually do. What, what is helpful for us is that, that we didn't make up this whole value-based care thing. Right. We didn't make up this whole way of being reimbursed on outcomes that existed already. Yeah. There's and it's really having a bit of a great... moment too, right? Like yeah. it's kind of, yeah. That's right, that's right. And there are companies that have done this for a long time and there are models um, to do this. And so I think there's, there's real uh, value in both charting a path. We, we were really at the forefront of serving the population we serve, the people on Medicaid, who we were duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, but we were using a whole bunch of elements of things that have worked before in similar populations in our healthcare system. And that that's a really, I think, important strategic choice, right? Uh, we get, we, there was, there was something to anchor onto. There was a, some sort of, there was a known quantity, known experience that these health plans could hearken to and say, okay, I saw it work here. I understand the model. It actually is exactly where we want to go, by the way. There's all of these tailwinds from a policy perspective at the state and the federal level pushing in that direction. Mm -hmm we understand how we can implement something like this to get us better outcomes for people who we know we need to serve. Great. Right. Yeah. I think a, a question, then this kind of related to, to uh, our conversation at Disrupt, but like for me and, and to hearing you talk about it, I understand where the optimism comes from, but like 
is it ever challenging for you because as an outsider and i think everybody knows listening that i'm canadian because i talk about it outsider. all the time outsider <laughs> you also just said outsider i did okay. say that uh, <laughs> but you know i i spent a lot of time like looking at the american systems and i'm just like constantly like oh this makes me so sad like it makes me very sad like i just i it makes me value socialized health care a lot more and i just am like oh great i'm glad we have this and i want to defend it for as long as i need to right but it i i tend to paint it in absolutes and it looks to me a lot of times like well there's nothing that can be done like ultimately the the interests that are sort of like aligned towards greed or whatever are going to overpower anything else that comes into the system to try to challenge that like do you ever have those moments where you're like i doubt that we can do what we need to do without that change at that level or are you are you very much optimistic that like no like even within the structures that exist we can make the real and lasting changes that we need to now i think i feel both um and it's a question about where you apply your time energy effort and how you how you do both we we absolutely have to redesign the way we provide care even if you know in a socialized system if we had medicare for all we had universal insurance we still have to figure out how to deliver health care differently and better yeah. and that we actually still have solve that problem. we have problems with that here right it's like not totally. a perfect system obviously totally yeah. and <laughs> and in our current base kind of current scenario we can do so much better with the system that we have we wouldn't need to change any policy. We wouldn't need to inject any additional funding. We could do so much better by people like today with our existing system. So we should do that. Even as we advocate for structural changes that make it easier to do better, easier to do right by the populations who really need it. And so I think of it as both. And uh, you know, I think an alternative life path perhaps, perhaps for me would be to think about you know, policy and mm. government um, but I know myself and I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at and I know uh, where where I get energy and part of I think what is incumbent on all of us as responsible citizens and just humans who care about others is to align our skills and talents and interests with um, endeavors that actually have a chance to create good for other people mm. and for me it is I love learning as I talked about I love building I love moving quickly and being scrappy and i think i'm an entrepreneur at heart and so how do i use that that sort of innate capability set and alignment with my skills and interests with my background as a physician to make the most possible change the biggest possible change with the system as it exists because i don't think we can afford to wait for right. big structural policy changes before we start to address the real issues on the ground today about how patients access and receive healthcare in this country. Yeah, it sounds like you would have a very difficult time as a policymaker for what it's worth based on those <laughs> inclinations, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, anyone who wants to move fast, right, is going to yeah. struggle as a policymaker. Yeah, it's a but... long game, a slow, long game. Yeah, but there's real trade-offs there, right? Because with, yeah. with, you know, with a stroke of a pen, you can make huge sweeping changes. That's but... true. You know, the flip side is is that we still are going to need people to innovate, build, and do take advantage of the policy in order to actually deliver the care and the outcomes. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, like, far less important than anything that we talked about, but, like, uh, I... <laughs> Classic Jordan. Um, but <laughs> we can preface I, the I, question, I, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I wanted to... Because Daryl brought up the, the Disrupt panel, and, like, I just, from just as like a personal question, I, I host Disrupt, so I, it's rare that I can actually sit and watch any of them, right? Even like a few minutes. But I remember having a second and kind of glancing over and it was, it got like kind of explosive. It was very memorable. Like everyone I at TechCrunch remembers that I panel. Say spicy, spicy. spicy is probably better. Yeah, spicy. I like that. Let's go with that. So, <laughs> spicy. And I just like, I remember walking away from that feeling like, man that was awesome and she's awesome like and i was just curious how you felt walking out of that right like walking out of that panel because i oh, felt wow. like you just really held your own and and it was awesome to watch i really enjoyed it well i i mean i enjoyed the debate um so i think and i think we we are all we need we need all kinds of people right doing different types of work in this ecosystem to make it better i am um, I, I i'm hesitant to 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 paint one way as the only path 
I do, this is to my answer to your earlier question too, which is, you know, we need a lot of different things to make this thing work better. Mm -hmm. right. It's hard for me to sit and hear someone as was sort of espoused in that conversation, um, elevate their perspective, which today is really about making care better for the 1% who can afford it as being a purer or more valuable way to build than focusing on the people who we focus on. That was hard for me. And, and so how did I feel leaving? I felt like, oh, I kind of lost my temper a little bit, which is unusual for me just in general. But I didn't see it that I, way. I <laughs> stand by what I believe in. And it was important to me because part of the work that we do and part of the reason why I do this work is because I believe that we need to give voice to people who, whose needs have not been met well, who don't have a seat at the table, who don't have the benefit of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in tech and R&D and innovation designed around their preferences and their needs and their well-being. Like my patients, our members at CityBlock deserve to be valued and privileged and their needs deserve to be centered in the way that we think about investing in healthcare and what we think is important in healthcare. And it was really important to me to assert that in that conversation because they get left behind all the time. And all the stuff that we laud and vaunt as, as innovation in healthcare, frankly, across our ecosystem with technology, doesn't touch their lives at all. Yeah. And that's not yeah. okay. Like we have to redefine what success looks like in terms of innovation. And, and I don't think you're successful if you have not built something that soon, not in some hypothetical future, but soon could make life better for people who need it the most, or the most to gain yeah. and the most to lose from the, the ecosystem as it exists today. Yeah. No, yeah. That's, I, I think it's a thing that is, I mean, it's just personally a constant source of frustration is like, you hear a lot of people we talk to will talk about like, well, we're doing the expensive thing now because eventually it will become the cheap thing for everyone. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cost and I'm like, now. show me one example. <laughs> when is this ever give me one. <laughs> <laughs> just give me one and then i'll back down you know <laughs> with like with a sustained consistent like level of quality right it's like maybe that happens to some extent but the thing that people get in the trickle down scenario does not resemble the thing that started at the top right no, so right. yeah uh, or show anyways. me your business plan or your like plan to make it so and that's right. not like a what are the steps we're in gonna, between? <laughs> yeah just just <laughs> yeah. Like, sh show it to me and then I'm, and then i'll stand down right yeah yeah no but i for what it's worth i also don't think um i think you came off as like just genuinely passionate about a topic yeah i like didn't read about. it as a, a loss of temper yeah, at all yeah. i think i read it as oh, I was like pissed. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, like, good, right? Like, I felt like that was warranted in that situation to be yeah. pissed. But also, like, it didn't look like you were, like, angry so much as it looked like you had, you were like, I'm actually just right. Like, yes. and, and can you just listen to me? Because yeah. I'm right. Like, that's what it felt like as an audience member, for what it's worth. Thank you. I think we all related to you in that moment as well. Like, I'm right. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I mean... It's why we appreciate talking to you is because it's like a it's a genuine conversation, right? Yeah, it's it, candid. But I and I do want to ask too, just because you know it did come up recently. Like I know I had to step back from the business and um, was very candid about you know his reasoning for doing so, and that was a, like an admirable way to talk about something that is probably a very difficult decision and something a lot of founders don't talk about. But how? Has that been for you, right? Like as somebody who has now stepped in and you're a part of the office of the CEO, um, you know, running the, the company in his absence. And, you know, what's the experience generally, I guess, with, with you know, having co-founders go through that kind of thing and, and have to take some time out and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I'm incredibly proud of him. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's one of the most sort of deep and intimate relationships of your life, really, right. building in these circumstances with someone. And so, most importantly, I'm just proud of him and you know happy that he's he did what he needed to do. Um, you know, I think we are so fortunate to be at this stage in our business and in our company's evolution that um, that we have built something that is not dependent on any one human being. Um, it can't be at this stage, right? And mm -hmm. uh, and that myself included, like nobody, right? Um, right? We really, you have to again, part of dignifying this work and the people who we serve is building a company that can sustain the work. 
because anything could happen to any one of us in any moment in any time right and we yeah. know that uh, and we have to be responsible in the way that we that we build and so in many ways i think being you know being at this stage of the company uh was a real it was it was we were fortunate and um and we have an incredible team just an amazing team of people across all of the domains um mm. who have stepped up and continue to step up and continue to ensure that we're moving forward um and that is that's all you can ask um under any circumstances but in particular right now i'm just very very proud of the team and proud of the work that we've continued to do yeah yeah, yeah. i think like does it do you think that it's something I, I feel like it's just so rare right and we talk to founders a lot on this show and founders will tell us about their challenges especially when it comes to like mental health or whatever but like i, I just wonder if you think it's something that more people should talk about or how people should handle it when they do encounter those challenges because they must come up for everyone right like yeah. how, how do you deal with it personally when you when you are stressed out or don't feel like maybe i don't want to go in today or you know like that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like if, if there's one thing we've learned through COVID, it's been just how important and underappreciated mental health has been in our public discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think it's 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 really interesting to see, and I think a really good thing, a silver lining of what we've been through, to see the ways in which people are acknowledging and understanding and really investing in, in mental health um, as a result of this really unprecedented time that so many of us have gone through. And so that's a good thing. And it, it's it's no more important for, you know, CEOs and founders of big companies than it is for every single person who gets up every day and has to go to work and put food on the table. Um, if they're grieving a loss of a person or a way of life or a way of being, they're homeschooling their kids. Like it is just every, it's important for everybody. Mm -hmm. And And I think, you know, one of the things that was really powerful about, you know, the way that we talked and think about this moment is recognizing for some of us that we have the privilege in in the middle of the pandemic to to um to to really take time and take care of ourselves others don't right. how do we make sure that that is more equitably um uh, afforded to people um how do we think about how we support our teams and our workforce i think every day about our frontline care team members who have been uh, working to continue to expand care to our members even through some of the hardest times that our generation has ever seen and probably will ever see. And so so I think more broadly that this is just a reminder that mental health matters and is important. And for me personally, um, you know, I, I, wa I want to be doing this for, for as long as I possibly can. And it has always been important for me to think about balance and to, um, to take time for myself. I I look forward to going to work every day. Um, I am so, so fortunate that I have a team that is supportive and is incredible. Um, and I also know that, that like everybody, if I need a break, I need to take it. And that, um, that we all have to lean in and support each other in, in all the ways that we, that we do. And we'll learn to do even better in the future as we just as a society get better at talking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, especially now it's like, you know, people just need to feel like they can take the time that they can take. Right. And yeah. I think, uh, especially like you said, if, if they're privileged enough to be able to do so, and it's, it's and it should like, be available much more broadly be available. Yes. Yeah. Yes. More people should be privileged to do so. Right. Yeah. Like that's the bigger issue. But yeah, but it sounds like, I mean, things like city block will help, right? Because the outcomes yeah. are long-term and when you're yeah. doing those things, like that's what struck me when you're talking about it earlier, when you're building those, things on the front end instead of because you built we built the hospital stuff we built the crisis outcome we've built that right. part already and we understand that and we can activate it should we need to but we haven't yet built sustainably the other side and every yeah, time right. we go and do that in the community you're not just doing it once you're building the rails so that it can happen again right which is right. which is another fantastic outcome like not only for your, the community, but also for your business, right? If you have to think yeah. about it in just a dollars and cents way, it's like, oh, good, your costs go down over time. But like, also net net benefit for the world. So that's fantastic, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, Sick bottom line. Yeah, yeah. Tool Sick one. double bottom line, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's about it for time. Do we have? Oh, we have one. 
Uh, I don't really understand. Yeah, no, I don't think that one. But (laughs) but I do think thank you for the audience, right? Because they were engaged and chatting it up and hopping. And also big thank you to Toyin. We had a lot of questions we didn't get to. So, but this one I just couldn't make heads or tail of. So that's my fault. Yeah, I'm not sure (laughs) either. So. But yeah, well, thank you, so Toyin. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was really great to chat with you. Yeah. We'll have you back again, I'm sure, for something sooner. If not Another later. spicy panel. Yeah. 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 You just know. It. Regular, actually. Like, just become our third co host. <laughs> yeah. You well, have man, time, right? Oh, you have plenty of time. Yeah. Just, like, yeah. Chop it You're up like, every Thursday. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, speaking of, uh, Found Lives comes to you every other Thursday, so we'll see you in two weeks. And next Thursday, it will be the Equity Live crew. And uh, with that, I think we're ready to sign off. Yeah. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Thanks for Thank watching, you. audience. Thanks, Toyin.